Is Israel's right-wing government accelerating the annexation of Palestine? What do its latest policies on settlements show? The poor are being bankrupted as rich nations spend billions for private healthcare. What does Oxfam new report expose about the role of development finance institutions? Mali voted for a revamped constitution in its recent referendum. It backs a unitary state with checks on the president's powers. But will differences with the UN mission over tackling an Islamist insurgency and other issues persist? We look at all these questions and more in Daily Debrief. The threefold increase in Israeli settlements in Palestine over six months has sparked fierce resistance among Palestinians, but also misgivings among its avid supporters. While reports indicate that there may be differences between the military security establishment and the far-right elements, that seems to be no bar to the occupation's policies. Let's ask Abdul from People's Dispatch to explain what these mean. Abdul, what really explains the Israeli state's approach towards sending people into Palestinian territories, occupying lands, building homes over there? And then later on, we see these statements which occasionally condemn uh, you know, what's going on. What explains this? Well, uh, it seems like uh, as a part of the larger project of basically which Israel has, it is a well-known fact that Israel has a policy of kind of uh, creating facts on the ground in the occupied territories, which ultimately will lead to some kind of uh, denial of Palestinian statehood. And okay. for that particular, with this strategy, which has a strategic motive, of course, and has a religious uh, uh, sanction also. Uh, when we talk about strategic, of course, you see that uh, Israel always wanted to control the Jordan River, the source of water. And even, and ever since the occupation, they have basically pursued a systematic approach of building uh, settlements. Today, there are around 700,000 uh, illegal settlers living in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem. And uh, that basically is a part of that larger project which we were just referring to, to basically create facts on the ground to control the water, water sources, to control the international border with Jordan somehow, and kind of, uh, uh, and along with that, of course, the rise of the right-wing, ultra-right-wing uh, religious uh, fanatics inside the Israeli political system uh, has also basically strengthened in uh, this particular uh, approach. Uh, what is called the Allen Plan, which was initially conceived in 1967-68, uh, basically is unfolding on the ground. Uh, so occasional condemnation by US and other international players hardly makes any difference. Uh, and and it seems when whenever they occasionally issue the, the, such a statements like uh, uh, this illegal process is not acceptable and so on and so forth, basically they take it as an as some kind of spontaneous uh, ad hoc policy of a settlement expansion, which is which it is not. It is a systematic approach. Uh, it has, as I said before, it has both strategic and religious agenda behind it. Uh, when we talk about religious agenda, it basically means that the religious right wing believes, there is ideological belief that it is there is no best, best bank. It is Judea and Samaria, a part of the Holy Land, which was promised right. to the Jews. And the Palestinians living there are uh, do not have legitimate right to be there. So all this together basically explains if we go into the details of it, explains the Israel's uh, policy of settlement settlement expansion in the occupied territories. Abdul, let's talk now about the timing. Why is it heating up so much now? And there's a lot of international condemnation also, which we are seeing building up. Well, uh, there are there is a complex web of uh, reasons, basically. Complex set of reasons basically explains the recent uh, upsurge in the uh, settlement activities, in the settler violence, in the occupied territories. As you rightly pointed out, of course, there are authorities which are responsible for providing security, quote unquote, to the in illegal settlers inside uh, the occupied territories. And they have their own mechanism of 
dealing with the Israeli state. So that is one part, of course. But the major part is uh, the, the Israeli establishment, the Isra current Israeli government is basically dominated by the settler, uh, the leaders from the settler movement, whether it is uh, Smotrich, uh, uh, who, who has been, who has a record of leading settler movement, fanatic settler movement inside the occupied territories, whether it is Ben Guir, who has uh, uh, led uh, settlers on and off and kind of have also claimed uh, some kind of uh, authority over the Palestinian religious uh, institutions like right. Al-Aqsa or uh, the defense minister in Israel, all of them, the prominent leadership basically comes from the settler movement. And since they are in the government, which is considered to be the most right-wing government in the history of Israel, uh, they think that they, this is the time for them to kind of expand the uh, uh, settlements as much as possible and 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 uh, push their larger agenda of uh, uh, a kind of greater Israel. Uh, uh, so denying the Palestinians completely any uh, hope uh, of a separate state uh, uh, in the future. So given that fact that they are politically dominant in the Israeli uh, power system, uh, political system at the moment, they think this is the right time to push forward it. Right. And so, so settler violence, increased settler violence should also be seen in that particular context. They basically tr are trying to create fear among the pal common Palestinians in the occupied territory so that they, the resistance uh, is minimized and a fear is created so that more and more uh, Palestinian territories are available for uh, taking and uh, building for, of illegal settlements there. All right, Abdul, thanks a lot for joining us. Hospitals turn into prisons in the world's poorest countries as private hospitals refuse to let patients leave without paying their hefty bills. Even the dead are not spared. The decades-old idea that the private sector can participate in healthcare is smashed in a new Oxfam report aptly titled Sick Development. Anna Raka from the People's Health Movement joins us now to explain the most important findings and how they relate to issues that activists and patients have raised for many years. Anna, thanks for joining us. An important report, it seems, from Oxfam. Now, every country would say that it's a priority to provide health care, affordable health care, universally accessible health care. But that's not really the picture that this report is painting, is it? Yeah, I think that what we can say, it's exactly the opposite in some way. Um, Although the report does focus on, you know, how high income countries and more specifically the institutions that they use uh, for international development uh, in um, investment. Um, so, you know, like development banks and um, development loans or uh, aid loans, how they actually uh, manage or maybe it's better to say, don't manage uh, to fulfill the aid set in healthcare uh, on the global level. So, you know, uh, generally, when we look at how these countries talk about health in the international sphere, uh, they're very dedicated to sustainable development goals. So, you know, they're, they're, the governments are all about uh, providing equitable uh, healthcare all around the world, improving access to healthcare, reducing the cost uh, for uh, which uh, patients uh, have to pay for at uh, at, uh, at the location where they receive the care, uh, and so on and so on. But what the report shows is that uh, these countries who are very vocal about uh, the good that they're doing in the world uh, are actually very, uh, very poorly informed about how their investments uh, are used, uh, who they benefit mostly, uh, and what, uh, what essentially what the results are. The report looks uh, at uh, development finance institutions uh, from four European countries, uh, so uh, Germany, France, um, the UK, and then uh, the European Union. Uh, but they also look at the World Bank um, and. Interesting, interestingly, what the report shows is that uh, so in the period between 2010 and 2022, uh, there were uh, over 350 investments made in private health companies overall. Uh, okay. So 67 investments of those, uh, they amounted to 2.2 billion US dollars. So those were direct investments into into healthcare. 
even more, of course, if we look at uh, how uh, indirect investments were made, uh, there were 206 of those which, which were made through intermediaries. So uh, the presumption is, is that it would be a bit more difficult to follow how the money went to the, uh, to the healthcare system in, in receiving countries, but it should be doable. Uh, these kind of investments amounted to $3.2 billion, uh, but of course it's, uh, you know, it's not quite clearly defined how much of it ex specifically went to, went to healthcare. And so, you know, as I said, what the report shows is that uh, these, uh, these investment companies, finance, uh, finance institutions uh, in Europe uh, and the World Bank, uh, essentially they're not really sure um, they don't have an overall picture. For example, the okay. report quotes several examples where you know the researchers reached out to uh, to these uh, to these institutions, asking them about the particular investment. They say, "Oh, but you know, we don't know about this. Are you sure this is our investment?" Uh, so uh, it's uh, <laughs> there. There should be a lot, a lot to say about the the accountability uh, of uh, of the institutions to uh, the people who they collect money from and to the people who they are responsible uh, to for for building better. Uh, health systems. So, you know, right. basically what um, what the report shows is that it's a very problematic field. Um, in addition to, to the uncertainties that I just uh, uh, talked about, uh, there's also a history of uh, channeling these investments through uh, intermediaries, uh, which are located in tax havens. So there's, you know, there, there's another layer of accountability issues being added here. Um, and unsurprisingly, the report shows that, uh, you know, this, uh, this kind of development and, uh, yes, essentially this kind of development area, uh, should be changed quite drastically if the world wants, uh, to actually see the results that it's supposed to, it's supposed to achieve. Right. Now, and, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are countries where people are kept trapped in the hospitals until they pay the bills. And this is happening, I think, in, in African countries, in two African countries in particular. Can you just go into some of the details of what Oxfam has said? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, essentially, there were two reports published at the same time. Uh, there is one report looking a bit more closely into cases, um, cases in India which is, uh, you know, a topic uh, on its own. But uh, this report in, uh, focuses also on different African countries uh, which were recipients of such investment and uh, which were private health institutions, private health, uh, private hospitals uh, have benefited from, from the money while the report shows they haven't actually done much to improve access to healthcare for people. Uh, one of the examples is definitely Kenya. That's the example that you quoted in your introduction. So uh, in the Nairobi Women's Hospital, which is not just a women's hospital, it's a chain of hospitals uh, which provide overall health care. Uh, but uh, there's a disturbing track record that the report uh, shows uh, where patients have been kept essentially imprisoned in hospital if they haven't been able to pay the bills that the, for the healthcare they received. Uh, so this includes uh, women who have just given birth. So, you know, uh, either the children were kept in hospital and the, the women were forced to, uh, to leave the hospital and then to go back, back and forth to breastfeed the children every day. Uh, and the, the children were kept there until the, the bills were paid or until the case reached the media and then it was resolved through that. It also, uh, you know, impacted school children. So it's a very, very vulnerable po population that we're talking about here. It's uh, it's hitting hardest at the people who need healthcare the most. So those are the people who really need to have access to good quality healthcare at any time. Um, and I think that there's one more thing that maybe we can highlight here. It's not in Kenya. I think the report talks about uh, Nigeria when it uh, when yes. it talks about this. Um, so. It's essentially going against the argument of, about reducing the expenditure uh, of healthcare of uh, direct uh, costs incurred by patients. This is one of the top aims that uh, uh, that governments are talking about now. You yeah. know that we should stop catastrophic health health expenditure. Uh, but the report shows that you know all these aims which should be going into that direction are actually nowhere near that. Uh, and if we look at uh, uh, women, uh, pregnant women in Nigeria, 
so uh, it can cost uh, several years of income for the poorest uh, women in Kenya to give simple childbirth. So they are admitted to hospital if the uh, if the childbirth uh, process goes according to plan without any complications. For uh, for the bottom fifty percent of the population, it will cost them about nine months worth of income. Okay. Of course, you know, if there are complications, if you need a C-section, if you need anything else, the cost rises. So um, it's not only Nigeria, of course, if you if you look at what the report shows uh, as an average in the health institutions which benefit from this kind of investment. Um, it's if you are in the 10 in the bottom 10 percent of the population overall, mm -hmm. uh, it will cost you about 16 years worth of income if you give birth through a c-section 16 okay. years so it's uh you know it's not even serious we cannot talk about stopping catastrophic health expenditure if women are expected to give so much money to give birth right on us basically what the report is showing us is that there is no room for private fund for funding private health care there is there is no alternative really to public funded health care which is universal and provides people with everything from basic care to the highest level of care absolutely absolutely so you know we've seen that also there were attempts to go into primary health care um, by private companies but yes. this fortunately has been very reduced and it has been reacted by uh, from the WHO uh, and essentially, yes, what you're saying, it's very true. Uh, there's no alternative to universal public health care. Thanks, Anna. Thanks for joining us with that uh, absolutely shocking uh, details of that report. Mali's new constitution paves the way for elections in 2024. It's widely seen as a step in the right direction as people overwhelmingly backed it. Mali is battling corruption and an Islamist insurgency, and it confronts the after-effects of coups that led to French forces leaving last year and Colonel Asimi Goita consolidating his power. Prashant from People's Dispatch joins us now in the studio with more. Prashant, now the new constitution makes a lot of changes. Seems to be that Bamako is shifting away from its past in a big way. What are the real uh, uh, important changes that the constitution posits? Right. I think so. Two or three aspects to highlight. One, of course, is the fact that there are substantial changes in the core institutional structure of the Malian state. Let's call it that way. In terms of how the presidency, the parliament, all these institutions are envisaged. There's considerable change in that. So, uh, you know, there has been, in fact, some criticism that there is a lot of concentration of power in the president. But actually, if you look at the details, what it shows is that a lot of those details were in the earlier version of the constitution right. as well. So it's now that a lot of fresh powers have been introduced. Uh, the prime minister has been made more accountable uh, to the president. Uh, you know, but there's a new house of parliament that has been brought into the Senate. And this is an interesting move because uh, earlier there was no real certainty of Mali is also a diverse country. There was no real certainty over whether it was a unitary state or a federal state. Right. Now the constitution has taken a very clear stand that it is a unitary state. And then based on that, uh, you know, what we have also seen is that to accommodate the diversity in the country, they've also set up a Senate. So now the Senate is also involved in the various procedures and stuff. And uh, there's also, they've also brought in a pr pr provision for impeachment of the president in extreme circumstances. So that kind of balances out to some extent the uh, you know, the role of the, the powers of the president, as they say. But uh, this is one key aspect of it. And then there are also, for instance, the question of considering that there's been a huge anti-imperialist wave in Mali. That's Mali right. is one of the countries in Western Africa, which has seen a very profound and substantial movement against France and French uh, forces who were ostensibly there to fight terrorism, but actually did not succeed and had become very unpopular. So Mali saw a very profound movement against them and we need to understand the military coup in that took place in Mali in the context of this movement. So usually when we say military coup, we think of, you know, uh, evil and greedy military generals who kind of capture right. power. But I think the cases, the countries in Western Africa are a bit different because the armed forces or the officers who came to power seem to have been riding on what was a wave of strong anger against their governments. Uh, and the main reason people were angry against the existing governments was the fact that these governments were one uh, very hand in glove with the French. 
and to the fact that the French had actually failed to address the issue of right. uh, terrorism and Islamic extremism for that matter. So this, co this constitutional referendum was conducted by a transitional military council and it kind of you know sets the structure for that and keeping this in mind there is for instance French has been demoted in terms of a working language and yes. Malian languages have been given uh, priority. So there have been some of those uh, gestures towards the anti-French sentiment as well. But overall, what we are seeing is that, you know, there's an attempt to, I think, re-envision the republic. So, there is, you know, there's this call for a fourth republic. Yes. And that is uh, based, that has been the key point for this referendum. And also, I think it's important to note that this will, next year, elections are scheduled to be held based on this constitution. A uh, new president will uh, be elected and then they'll be moved away from the transitional military council. So that's the overall context. And of course, secularism has been reiterated, which was you know, opposed by some sections. Some new accountability measures have been imposed in terms of key office holders declaring, uh, you know, having to declare uh, their wealth. So some interesting measures uh, here and there as well regarding some of those steps. But I think the key test of this constitution will be, of course, next year when the elections take place. But also equally important, the fact that uh, you know, it also depends on how uh, the fight against the extremism and separatist insurgencies are, that are taking place, that also proceeds because irrespective of whether the fact that the constitution is good or not, irrespective of what the intentions of its rulers are, if they're not able to deliver on those fronts, it becomes a, a bit of a problem. So that's right. definitely an issue. Yeah. Prashant, now looking at some of the recent challenges that Mali has faced, how do you think it will pan out in the future? Right, very uh, tough to say. Mali is actually very delicately poised right now because like I said, on the one hand, there are these insurgencies which actually even affected the voting in some regions. In fact, I believe voting did not take place in one region right. uh, because of that our colleague Pawan has a story, of course, that details all of this. Uh, did not take place in one region because of that and it's a constant battle that's going on. Uh, so, you know, Wagner forces, I, I believe, have been involved as instructors, that's what they call themselves in some of these uh, regions as well. There is a dispute also with the United Nations. The United Nations had said that, uh, you know, they did back this referendum, they were very supportive of it. But there has been a conflict with the UN on the UN peacekeeping forces that are there, the 15,000 odd soldiers right. who were there. Uh, there have been allegations against the Malian army in terms of human rights violations. Mali has strongly denied it. Mali has also said that, uh, you know, they are not happy with uh, how the UN mission is performing. And in fact, its mandate is set to end uh, at the end of the month. Whether it right. will be renewed or not is a big question. So uh, that definitely is a very key issue, remains to be addressed. But I think fundamentally, like I said, the large question is basically about this. Will uh, the government be able to regain some of the ground that has been lost to these separatist groups and insurgencies? Uh, will it be able to convey to the people that, uh, you know, it is able, it has a strong social program? In fact, incidentally, I think the new constitution also uh, assures access to water uh, as one of the key, uh, I believe, okay. uh, points, which is a very interesting thing. I think basic amenities... Uh, calling that a fundamental right is a very interesting aspect as well. But again, it's all words until it is implemented. The other interesting thing, of course, is that the region as a whole is seeing a churn. So there has been, for instance, greater collaboration between countries like Mali, Burkina Faso. Uh, you know, there have been a lot of discussions between these governments. And that reflects, I think, a tendency which is often not talked about too much now, which is of pan-Africanism itself. You know, and uh, you know, generally among the people too, there is there is a large sentiment of an understanding that the borders that were established uh, were basically the creation of Western colonial powers, and uh, these are, many, many of these borders are pretty nonsensical in some ways. Right. So uh, the dream of progressives in across Africa has always been for a more pan-Africanist perspective, where countries can you know collaborate well, maybe even federate at some point and uh, try to address some of their challenges together. And this is all the more relevant at a time when you have organizations like the IMF or World Bank who impose conditions. Countries are finding it difficult to sort of address the sovereignty question. You know, how do you sort of deal with, uh, as, a, as one individual country, are you able to sort of deal with the kind of conditions that are imposed? So does further integration and collaboration make sense? Is, I think, a question countries across the world are dealing with. And in Africa, it is also animated by the sense of pan-Africanism that is there. So I think the challenge for the rulers of Mali are on one hand on the security front, definitely a tough question. But on the other hand, I think also looking at, uh, you know, how some of these economic and social challenges can also be addressed and also an ideological, whether that will be possible. There are organizations working on this front. We have, for instance, the West African People's Organization recently founded, which is sort of, uh, you know, 
and uh, say pushing some of these agenda as well. So altogether, I think uh, these are some of the key questions and challenges before Mali right now. Right. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us, Prashant. And that's all we have for today. Thanks very much for watching Daily Debrief. We'll see you again on Thursday. Until then, you can find more of our work on our website, peoplesdispatch.org, our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and our YouTube channel have more updates and this show, Daily Debrief. Thanks again for watching. Thank <laughs> you.